all of the drugs, whether it's heroin, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, all of them activate the dopamine pathway. All of them. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that's released with pleasurable events. And it is basically the neurotransmitter system that's, that, that defines the pleasure pathways in the brain. The drugs of abuse are five times at least more uh, reinforcing and compelling as, as the things that our brain reward system evolved in the first place to be rewarded by, like food or sex or whatever. And drugs are so much more rewarding to our brains than that. We will do anything. They commandeer our brain reward system and drive our behavior. And that takes powerful treatments to thwart those drives. Hello, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Nora Volkov. And I want to ask you some questions. If at any point you feel uncomfortable, just let me know. Now, um, you, you are how old? 43. So you've been taking methamphetamine for 10 years? Yeah, more. Or more. Yeah, about so, so how did it start there? Um, well, I was doing a lot of coke, mm -hmm. and the meth got me off of coke, for one thing. And meth gave them the same kind of buzz, but it would last longer and would cost less. How did it affect your life, methamphetamine? When, when you're not on it, you just feel so unnormal and you kind of really like to get some just to get back to a normal feeling. Place your hand in that yeah. box. That's gonna get a little warm. We're gonna let you rest for about 10, 15 minutes to get warm. Do you feel comfortable? Sure. With imaging techniques, now we can directly take pictures of the working human brain. So we can compare the brains of people that are addicted to drugs with that of people that are not addicted to drugs under very different conditions. For example, we can stress the dopamine system, which is the system that is activated by drugs. 20 seconds. So what we want to do now in this study is to see in people that are addicted to methamphetamine how the dopamine cells are functioning. Five, four, so we're measuring two, the magnitude of that surge, which is an indication of really, once you stress the dopamine cells, how do they respond? It's equivalent to when, for example, they send you to a cardiologist and they put you on a treadmill. So they, they stress your, your heart to see how it responds. Okay, so we have the, the results. This, this is your image, and what we've shown is an image of a person of um, just also a, a man, man of the same age and that's not taking any drugs. Let's look at the normal brain and you see them. The areas in red show very, very high concentrations. This is one of the the uh, cells in the brain that's most sensitive to the damaging effects of methamphetamine. Look at your brain and see how that red basically has disappeared. All of this part here is gone. You can clearly see there's much less activity in your brain than in the brain of this person. So one of the concerns is, of course, that as people that take methamphetamine grow older and continue to take it, are they putting themselves at risk? for neurological diseases. That won't go away. That won't go away, and that will create symptoms. So, I mean, when we were speaking, and I'm being candid with you, because there's po no point of not being it. If you continue to take methamphetamine, this will not recover. I mean, it's bottom line. The other thing that concerned me, too, is um, this thing. And it's actually, this is your brain MRI. Mm -hmm. This brain looks like the brain of a much older person. It looks like the brain of a 60-year-old. He clearly stated to us that he himself is not convinced that he wants to get detoxified. And that's exactly not uncommon, this ambivalence of the person that's addicted, because in a one, it's like they are in love with the drug in a way, but at the same time, there is this hatred because they actually, this loss of control. But there is an, uh, clearly an ambivalence, and he expressed it. Do you feel concerned about the image of your brain? Not really. Uh, again, I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't know if they can really, really tell whether they're fudging the picture, I don't know. It is actually incredibly telling, the notion of self-deception. To what extent you can self-deceive yourself to say this drug has not done anything wrong for me. But I want to impress upon you the importance of really trying to stay clean. Because you can do a lot of recovery. 
our brain has a tremendous capacity for recovery. So hopefully, if I stop using it in a year or two, it might, the red might come back So. Yeah, we've seen it in the past, but you have to stay clean, and it's not staying clean for three months, no, over a year, so it does require that. Okay. Denial is clearly a core feature of this disorder, and that, particularly in the early stages of the illness, people just refuse to face up to the fact that their use of drugs is impacting their life in important and substantial ways. You know, if you have a disease, why not deny that you have it? We do it all of the time. So denial is not sort of unique to this disease. And uh, part of the disease itself, of course, is to deny that you have it. It really is the job of the treatment professional to take that person with all of their ambivalence about being in treatment. They don't really want to be there. They're in half in denial about it and help them see both what damage addiction has done in their lives and how much better their life can be if they get clean.